it's time for us to welcome our guest for today. She is uh, joining us right now uh, from the other side of the country, the fabulous Bonnie Yates. She is here courtesy of Tolner Law Offices, uh, where she is a special education attorney extraordinaire. And we are so thrilled to have her back. We, we haven't been able to meet with her for a couple of weeks. So Barney, welcome back. Good morning. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm supposed to say that I'm an attorney. I'm one of seven attorneys that works at Tolner Law Offices. We're a California-based firm. We kind of cover most aspects of the, of the disabilities, uh, special education, regional center, uh, we can give you some help on insurance coverage for autism, although we're not specialists in that area, but we have contacts that are specialists. And um, and if you want a free consultation with one of uh, the lawyers in our office, you can go to our website at Tolner Law Offices, and there's a short form. It'll take you five minutes to fill it out or one minute to fill it out, and then we can set up a consultation with you. We are giving general advice on the show. We are not giving advice about your specific legal problem. And we're mostly answering questions under California law because we're in California, but IDEA is a federal program. So we also are giving you answers sometimes that are federal in nature. Um, but what we strongly suggest is if you have a specific problem and Lord knows people do, especially after the last nine months, you go to an attorney and if it's not in California and we can't help you, you go to COPA, C-O-P-A-A -A dot net. And that is a list of what I consider to be reputable attorneys who are committed to helping children with disabilities. And you can find somebody in your own state. Now, I just want to, before we get to the questions, because Shannon has a bunch of meaty questions you send it, sent in, I do want to tell you something that I learned apropos insurance coverage. We have a client, she needed to remove her child from public school. They wouldn't let him be in general ed. She put him in private school, private parochial school. She um, lives in California. She went to another attorney that I know and he helped her prepare for asking her insurance company <clears throat> to let her use her ABA hours at school. Now, this child is young, he's only six, but this attorney has had a lot of luck getting insurance coverage in these situations. And when I asked him why, he said, well, A, if the child is in private school, there's not the same expectation as if they were in a public program and the insurance companies may be more likely to allow that. What he did was he did her initial submission. So like he helped her put together the right documents along with her ABA provider to submit to the insurance company. When the insurance company said no, then he did an independent medical review for her, which is where you basically present the case to a doctor hired by the insurance company, and he got the hours approved. And so this is a really good stopgap measure for her child um, because it's very cost effective compared to due process. And so that's just something to consider. It's another avenue for you. And I'll just tell everybody, you can look the attorney up if you want to on CalBar. His um, offices are in Newport Beach, but he works all over the place. His name is Randy Curry, C-U-R-R-Y. And he's very reasonable in terms of what he charges for this. So um, I just wanted to mention that because like, I wasn't really... Um, aware that the trigger can be, well, the child is A, in a private school, and private schools don't have an idea menu of services, and B, what Randy apparently does is he uses existing evidence to show that failure to provide the aid is going to, or that behavior therapist, I don't like to use the word aid, is going to result in irreparable um, harm to the child, and he says that if you have worsening behaviors, or worsening social isolation, or you know, if any of the disability aspects are kind of getting ramped up by the being out of school or dealing with distance learning or whatever, he can sell that to the insurance company and um, successfully. So that's Sorry. a great that's a great thing. I mean, that's um, amazing. That's great news. Very yeah. useful news. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so tell the attorney's mm -hmm. name again. 
Randy, and the last name is Curry, C-U-R-R-Y. And all you do is go to Cal Bar, and they have an attorney list. You can look them up. Okay. I don't want to quote what he charges on the on the air because I, you know, I just feel a little funny doing that. But I got to tell you, nobody can do a due process for that little. Now he's very reasonable. Now here's the thing, though. Like this client, she got the services approved for six months, and so she's probably going to have to revisit the issue in six months. If we got a placement, whether it's via an IEP or a settlement agreement, there would be stay put. There's not stay put in this situation, but it ain't exactly easy to get the district to pay for ABA in a private school. And so if time is of the essence and you got to get your kid back into school, this is an, this is an option to consider. Yeah, and I always say, I don't know that it's true, it's much harder to take something away when you can show that it's working. Um, but, you know, I don't know, I, we're, we're in the wild, wild west, and we don't know what's going to happen in six months, but what a great thing to know for now. Yeah. Anyway, he's, he's a reputable attorney. The other thing he does is he sues insurance companies for bad faith failure to pay under the policies. So um, if your ABA provider is jerking you around, I mean, not your ABA provider, sorry, if your insurance company is jerking you around, thus putting your ABA provider in a position where it's hard for them to advocate because they're essentially forced to please two masters, I would definitely give him a call because I think he can, I think he can do some kind of incredible stuff very efficiently. I got to say, I mean, what we're seeing a lot of right now, and we kind of knew this was coming because, um, you know, when you have insurance, you go through a reauthorization on a regular basis and they keep making it more about the reauthorization than give services. So it used to be, you know, you got authorized for a year and then it was six months. Now, sometimes it's three months. Mm -hmm. So your provider is having to do constant paperwork to prove why you should still get the, the service. But we're seeing a, across the board that as we, as we hope we're moving out of COVID, a lot of people didn't, didn't have access to ABA or didn't utilize ABA because of a coronavirus and they were socially distancing. And now that they're coming back to it, insurance companies are reducing the number of hours that they said that they would authorize. And I'm telling parents, get a denial in writing and appeal, appeal, appeal. And, and you, know what I, but you know what I would add to that? If people possibly can, I would strongly recommend that they consult with Randy in California because, yeah. because not all appeals are equal and he knows what information to get in front of the insurance company at the initial request stage. And then later at the IMR, um, you know, it's insidious. I'll tell you, Bonnie, because like what I'm seeing with a lot of our families is that let's say that they've requested the, the ABA provider requested 25 hours. The insurance will come back and say, well, we're only approving 22. No reason, right? So then the family has to make a decision. Do I really want to go through the appeal yeah. process for three hours? And I'm saying to them, yes, you should appeal and, and ask for more than the 25 and cite COVID because they're trying to like, they're trying to make it so small of an amount that you'll go, okay, because mm -hmm. but then the next time they'll come back and say, oh, 15. Um, it's yeah. terrible. They'll Can you tell how much I love insurance companies? I do because when they do what they do right, they provide the help and support and and financial support to be able to get the right therapy. I do love well, insurance. My response, that, my response to that is that you're incredibly polite. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. Uh, I'm not. The reason I'm insurance sure. companies have money is because you guys pay premiums, and they, you know, they're hoping that you're not going to make a claim. That's so, right. They took on this autism thing because they were kind of forced to, and I think they're trying to get control back. Yeah, yeah, they are. And they're trying to, they're really trying to utilize where families are in COVID. And that's, to me, that's dirty pool. But yeah, let's, should we launch into some questions here, Bonnie? Yeah. You have questions, I have answers. Okay, great. I love that because I always theoretically. <laughs> so first question is school is saying we can't have ABA on the IEP. Can they really do that? If it's so effective, why can't we stipulate that it's how our child should learn? Well, you know, this was a hotly litigated issue because the IDEA says you can't um 
cause a district to choose a methodology and uh, they've, they've hidden behind that. But I think if you have someone who can attend your IEP, who can make the case that ABA is the only way your child can learn and you have a discussion about what process is implicated in that learning and why other types of learning don't work, they would have to give fair consideration to the idea that you needed ABA to learn um, and sort of try to get away from that methodology argument, which is a real problem in this context. Um, I mean, in general, it's a problem that we have because methodology is everything, right? You know, like if you're trying to learn how to read and you don't have a research-based literacy intervention available in the district, then you're not going to make progress using what the district has instead that's less expensive and maybe older and didn't require as much teacher training. So you will run up against a methodology argument. And I think what you probably want to do is talk about what other things have been tried and weren't successful and why and why this would be. And then if they say no, you make them give you prior written notice. And that's the basis of your due process. But I have to tell you, this question was asked. Let me, last... let me just say, let me just yeah. say, it's going to be a cold day in hell before every child with autism has the ABA program in public school that they should have. Doreen Grandpache, probably somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago, we were talking about this, and she said, Bonnie, it's not as if we don't know what works. Like, we know what works. We know what works. And the rest of this is just a game. There's two ways they play it. They either say no to methodology, or they say, yeah, you can have our district IBI. And then you get somebody in, you know, a psychologist in to look at that IBI. And it bears no resemblance to having a card program. It's just, you know, you can you can take a marker and write IBI on my face. And that doesn't mean it's it's a beneficial program. And that's kind of what they're doing with the IEP. Well, I have to tell you that the way this question came about was somebody asked this during Ask Dr. Doreen last Wednesday. And mm -hmm. Dr. Grant and I and Dr. Grandpache was saying, uh, we were talking about it. I said when I had this happen that you had said to me, listen, there's more than one way to get what you want. You can either, you know, fight it this way, but they're going to say that you, that you can't uh, stipulate as to the methodology, or, you know, if you're hundred percent clear with what you want and card is clear with, with what they want, then you can go in and say, we want this, this, and this written into the BIP. You don't call it ABA, but you say what you're asking for. And that was what we eventually did. And she said, Dr. Grampiche said, go back to Bonnie and see if they can, at this point in the game, she said, with all insurance paying for ABA and everybody widely accepting how effective it is, ask her, are, can they still make the methodology argument? So what I'm hearing is they can, but, but you can, you really can fight it. Yeah, and you can always amend the behavior support plan. You know, and that, that might be a better way to go, but you would run the risk of people interpreting the behavior support plan in a way different than you wrote it. I mean, yes. it's, it's, you know, it's 2021, and I just had a call from a family in the South Bay and their question was like, what great schools are there for high functioning kids with autism in this area? And I shouldn't be having to go like this and like, think, 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 right. think, oh, okay. You know, and there's like very few options. And some of them I don't really consider to be great. Like why, if we have this pervasive disability, like if the insurance companies can do it, why can't the districts? Yeah, and they can. I think that's the disappointing thing. Are they in the Bay Area, the North Bay Area, or the Bay no, Area, the they're South? They're in um, Hermosa Beach. Okay, yeah. And then I'm still scratching my head with that one too. In the North Bay Area, I have a school that I recommend to everybody, but not in uh, Huntington Beach. So there you go. Yeah, um, in California, I've learned since I've been with Colner, has more what David 
Tolner calls specialty schools. You know, there's a lot more options for kids up there. Yep. And why, you know, why we can't do that down here. Although I do recommend Chime down here, but that's not the Bay Area. Yeah, never get in. yeah it's hard. To, yeah, because everybody wants in there. In any case. I mean, we could, uh, talk, about, I mean, we could talk about, you know, sometime we could have a, a conversation about like schools that our clients get placed in and just give your audience a, a little flavor for what some of those schools are like. Yeah. Um, they're important. And, you know, now some of our kids with autism are also having to address a specific learning disability yep. and schools that do that are important and few and far between, Absolutely. you know, nobody has explained to my satisfaction yet. And I'm just throwing this out to you, Shannon, maybe, you know, the answer. Nobody has explained to me what this comorbidity is where so many of the kids with autism are hyperlexic, but they don't understand what they're reading. Like what's, What's causing that? I don't know what's causing it, but you know that CARD has worked really hard over the last 17 years trying to phenotype autism. And, and on the good news, they're, you know, they've been able to phenotype 17 species of autism, and that's one of them. Mm -hmm. And what they're looking at is what's the most effective way of teaching to that, but cause, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody knows. Yeah, but it's anyway, very, it's it's very different type. I, I want to say, yes, I want to say autism. You also have to have a specific learning disability, please. Yeah, rough. Uh, I also want to say to Johanny, who's written in a question, we are going to get to your question before we're done, um, but I, I have to get to a few more of these with Bonnie. Uh, somebody wants to know, should we postpone our IEP until we know whether it will be distance learning? I'm in LAUSD and we're hearing that they will require the vaccine in order to attend school in person in the fall. Our child has extenuating health concerns. In addition to ASD, we are not sure whether he will be approved for the vaccine. We could be distance learning for a while. And I just wanna say that since Austin Butner made that comment, um, he's the, the superintendent of LAUSD schools. He made a comment a couple of weeks ago about um, that they would be, if you want your child to attend in person in the fall, that they would be requiring the vaccine. Within 48 hours, he walked that back because as we pointed out here on the show, there is no vaccine that has been approved by the FDA as yet for children. In fact, for anybody under the age of 18. So, you know, he's assuming that that will be in place by then. So he had to walk it back. Um, but Bonnie, should they postpone their IEP and say we no, want to I don't later? Think so. I've struggled a lot with this question and, you know, in the process of trying to get ground under my feet the last nine months, I don't think I can say it enough. I feel, I feel as, um, kind of blindsided by a lot of the things that have happened as anybody does, I think. So it occurred to me at a certain point that no, you don't want to postpone IEPs. What you want to do is you want to get together with them and tell them what you need and what you're getting and why it isn't working and ask them to provide it. And then if they say no, you've got a bad offer on file. So if you need to sue them, there's something happened during those months. It's not like, you know, it's, it's useful depending on what your angle is. Like if you're planning, if you're of the opinion that the way you have to get what you need is through litigation with the district, um, you want bad offers that you can beat at due process. So I, I've been telling my clients to please engage with the district and tell them everything that's happening during distance learning and ask them to come up with a way to improve things because it's not working. So have yeah. that IP, start the process. And I think we forget a lot of times, Bonnie, mm -hmm. that we can you know, have an IEP meeting and have a plan, but if something changes or is different, we just call in a new IEP meeting. Exactly. Okay. So uh, next question. My son has an ASD diagnosis. He's five and attending kindergarten online this year. We had completed our IEP before COVID and he had speech and OT services. It has been a nightmare. It took forever them to figure out how to do speech online and they never really figured out the OT. Now they are rec making recommendations for the new IEP and they are removing OT. Their rationale is he did okay without it. Please tell me this is as stupid as I think it is. 
You can invoke stay put okay. and say that you, you don't agree and and you don't see how they could know unless they're going to reevaluate him and compare where he was in terms of his benchmarks at the last reporting period to now. I mean, that's just a wholesale, not very clever, not very sexy, taking advantage of the situation, just like you were saying the insurance companies are saying, well, you know, you did fine. So, so no, I, that's wrong and you should object to it and you should fight it. It's so demoralizing, I think, for all of us to go really while we're down. You want to do, you want to play games, I'm but still here. I'm still in this place. Yeah. But yeah. I, I will say it's an opportunity for us as parents to stand up, exercise, flex, flex our muscles, right? And exercise the things that we've learned and go, no, not on my watch. You don't have to have a nervous breakdown over it. You don't have to get upset. You just, you just say, no, we'll be exercising the stay put. And if, and if you want, to, as Bonnie said, if you, if you feel that he doesn't need it, where's the evaluation, you know, like, where's put the them, data? yeah, where's the data? And then okay, once, next they, question. once they tell you that, Shannon, I should have said this, you ask for an IEE. Okay. That independent educational evaluation that they have to pay for. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are starting the process of asking for comp ed compensatory education this summer. Can you outline the steps of how we pursue this? My hope is to get them to pay for a one-to-one -one tutor for the summer. My fear is they will offer a summer school in person with masks. My son is in fourth grade. He has missed so much academically this year. And I am concerned that a summer of masks will not come close to getting him caught up. Uh, they don't say whether they're in California or another state, do they? They don't. I mean, you know, here's the thing about compensatory education. The IDEA, the IDEA, explicitly recognizes it as a remedy for a failure to provide FAPE. And secretly, I think all the school districts know they didn't provide FAPE from at least March 11th until the end of ESY. Um, so you can make a case for comp ed based on that, but unless you're, unless you're going to be able to sue them and force them to the negotiating table, I don't know that they're going to give it to you. You might be able to tell them you'll you'll enter into a settlement agreement with them to waive claims for the COVID time period if they give you certain things that you want. But typically, the good compensatory education um, results are after a due process filing. And I don't mean to be like one of these people, you know, who's like in la la land um, and assuming that everybody can bring a lawsuit. But the, the truth of the matter is, if you have a good case, you really can. If you, if, at least in California, you can go to the OAH website. There are free or low cost attorneys and you should at a bare minimum be discussing your case with an attorney. They won't charge you. And even if you're not gonna use the attorney, you'll get a lot of really good information in terms of how to present your case to the school district. But we've talked about this before on the show, and it continues to be true. Uh, in really all aspects of litigation in the United States, people are much more successful when they do these things with lawyers. And, you know, I don't like that. I would rather my job become unnecessary, but that's the reality. And I feel like I need to share that with you, especially if there's a vehicle for you getting someone to represent you, you know, free of charge. Why, why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. You know? I think people have fears and, and our fears are always that, you know, what if I can't afford it? What if, you know, uh, because then it will feel extra bad, but I well, will say this. OEH list has, has low cost and no cost referrals. Okay. So is that on the copaa.net? No, that's that? California Department of Education. Okay. They have an attorney. If, if you're not in California though, uh, go to copaa.net. No, I don't think. Well, to get an attorney, yes, but if you're specifically interested in a free or low cost attorney, um, I would contact your State Department of Education and see if they maintain a list. Okay, we did have somebody uh, wrote in and said, what is an IEE and what does it tell you about your child? Is the psychoeducational assessment different from an IEE? No, it isn't. Um, it's, what's different is, is this. If the district does an evaluation and you um, you disagree with it, then um, if you can show what's wrong with the evaluation, 
you can write the district a letter and ask them to pay for an outside evaluation at district expense. So when we do well in these cases, <clears throat> what we'll get is an agreement to provide not only just the psychoeducational evaluation, but speech, functional behavior, OT, you know, and, and that's a real game changer once there's some evidence out there that's not the district's evidence. So, so again, the, the IEE stands for? Independent Educational Evalu uh, Evaluation. And that is something that you can ask for, you have a right to, and the district has to pay for it. No, you ask for it and you give your reasons, although you don't have to give any reasons, and the district either has to pay for it or they have to file for due process. They can't do nothing. They don't okay. usually want to file for due process because it creates an additional, it's a it's an additional filing, it's an additional legal project, and they don't have you know, time to take things on. Um, the other thing I want to say is if you ask for an IEE and they say no and they do file against you, all you have to do is withdraw your request and the filing goes away. So it's really not dangerous to ask for it. Um, and in many cases, they will grant it because they think if they give it to you, you're going to shut up and go away. Yeah. So you, you know, you get ready for your IEP or your tri triannual IEP and they, they will assess your child and then you sit down with them and they say all these things about your child and you go, I, I you go, I don't think that they tested well. I don't, I don't agree with their findings, whatever. This is when sometimes parents feel like, well, it's over. They did their evaluation and I've got nothing to fight it because I can't afford to go pay for experts to say something different. It's the ideal, ideal time to ask them for the IEE. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, we, we're going to save the rest of the questions that we had for next week because we're running out of time. But I'm going to um, get to Johanny's question, and you're welcome to stay, Bonnie. It is not specifically a lawyer question, but I love your opinion on it, but you might need to go. What, what, are, what are your thoughts? Um, it's about finding a yeah. pediatrician. Well, you, want to stay or go? you might no, have a business. I'm going to answer it and then go. And okay. don't, don't be mad at me. Don't shoot me. Don't we like, won't shoot you. Don't Let like, me read the question though. They said, how do we find like-minded doctors? Our pediatrician is pretty useless. He doesn't agree GFCF diets are even effective for kids with autism, doesn't agree with our need for EEGs, et cetera. He does think we should treat for ADHD, even though he agrees he doesn't have enough information since he's in class online only the last 12 months. We are located in the suburbs of Philadelphia. So what is your answer to that, Bonnie? Don't get mad at me, guys, and I might not be current, but all those people that were Dan doctors, all they had to do was take a 13-hour course, and then they turn around and they charge families five or $600 an hour, and um, I felt like a lot of them were disreputable and profiting on the situation. I am not anti-science. I am not anti-vaccine, although I recognize that in some cases there may be a need for a medical exemption. What I saw was not a lot of good. I saw people investing in false hope and getting charged a lot of money. And I saw treatments, experimental treatments come and go over the years. And basically the thing that I saw that helped kids the most was ABA. Now that is not everybody's view and people have had positive experiences with the diet and with a whole lot of other things. Uh, your pediatrician, unless maybe they have their own autistic child, is going to be mainstream, and they're not going to sit with you and discuss things for two hours. And if you, you know, need that kind of medical support, you're going to be able to get it, but you're going to have to pay a lot of money for it. Um, none of these guys that I've ever seen takes insurance. Um, so I'm not sure... You know, like-minded doctors, I'm not sure that a nutritionist wouldn't be better, you know, I mean, maybe a functional medicine doctor, but I just, I have a hard time with a lot of what I've seen. I've seen, seen people spend a lot of money for stuff that didn't pan out. So that's just my well, point of view, and I'm being absolutely. very honest, and I apologize if I've offended anybody. I don't think you've offended anybody. I think you're entitled to your opinion. And, and I think we all appreciate hearing from you. I agree with some of what you said and some of it, I have a different experience. And I think that that's, I think it's important that we um, present 
everybody's everybody has a right to whatever. My son uh, had uh, well, saw tremendous know. improvement people on GM. People have a right to expose other people to COVID. You know, well, I, I, I think we can all agree I on mean, that. People, people, that, right? But I'm just saying everybody doesn't have access to the same information. I guess is the problem. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. But well, we appreciate you. I know you got to run. Um, I'm going to stay, and and unless you want to stay and hear my opinion on this, uh, <laughs> and you're welcome to do that. I would I, like to know, but I do have to go, so I apologize. Okay. And and you know, um, I I had I had a particular experience um, with with you know Nick, and um, I do recognize that that was only one experience. So. You know, and I me am, too, likewise. I'm always interested in learning from other people who've done something that I don't know about. Um, well, I, just don't, I just haven't had clients have the best experiences with the Dan doctors. Let me just put it like that. Well, and let me say that the Dan doctors don't exist anymore. Right. Some of them mi migrated over to MAPS, and we'll we'll talk more about that in a second. But I, Bonnie, I appreciate you. You're with Tolner Law Offices. How do people reach you at Tolner? Just go into the website and fill out the form, and then we will set you up with your initial consultation, which we don't charge okay. for. And so if you are, uh, and there's the website, specialeducationcouncil.com. If you are in California, Northern or Southern, or Arizona or parts of Nevada, Toner Law Offices uh, services are available to you in those states. Unfortunately, we lost our Nevada attorney. Okay, so, so just Arizona. California and Arizona then. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you, madam. We'll see you next week. Thank Are you, you with us next week? I am. I appreciate you. Okay. You take you care too. too. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks for watching Autism Live. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.